Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Courses on Demand brought to you by Forex.Academy. In this course, we will be discussing Fundamental Analysis and Decision Making, Volume 2. This does lead on from Fundamental Analysis and Decision Making, Volume 1. Now, there is, of course, inherent risk when in trading the financial market. So just before we begin, please do take a moment to familiar, familiarize yourself with the following disclaimer. Now, in focusing our attention to the study of fundamental analysis and decision making, we will be taking a closer look, particularly at fundamental analysis and the risk environment. With that risk environment, we need to understand and analyze economic data and understand how changes in economic data actually affect price over a wide range of asset classes. We will be looking at trading opportunities such as buying the rumor, selling the fact, and it often occurs across those financial assets, whether it's Forex or particularly in equity trading, where traders position themselves and actually trade off a rumor and then uh, trade the opposite side of that news story once the fact emerges into the marketplace. We'll then be looking at trading behavioral finance uh, and that does continue on nicely with avoiding uh, necessary market traps, particularly for those beginner traders. And then we'll be finishing off the lesson with fundamentals and timing. And obviously, one of the key skills to learn as a financial trader, uh, whether you're a fundamental or technical or, or, or both, is when to effectively have good timing, when to enter the markets um, early enough so that you're getting a good price that you so desire whether you're deciding to buy the market or sell the, the market, i.e. short sell. So timing is so crucial for financial trading. We'll be discussing the fundamentals behind that. Fundamental analysis and risk environment. In conducting our fundamental analysis, what, what do we aim to do? Well, we aim to arrive at an underlying fair value price. And that's really the motive for fundamental analysis. Whether you're deciding to fundamentally analyze a stock price, you have to understand the growth potential of that company, the competitor environment with which it operates and does business, uh, many, many factors to actually come to a fair value price. What you believe your analysis tells you that the price should be. If that is the case, then you can make trading opportunities as a result, you know, given that something might be overvalued or undervalued. And that is particular for equity trading, but has most certainly strong strength in, in, in construct when looking at commodity trading as well, particularly for assets like the soft commodities, corn, wheat, sugar, things like that. However, before we consider trading the asset, it is important to gain an, an understanding of the current market sentiment and its tolerance for risk. This temperature test is known as assessing the risk environment. So there always is a risk environment in the market's current market sentiment. Uh, and we, we need to understand what it is. There's a current appetite. The current market appetite for risk has real fundamental power over asset prices. From currencies to commodities to bond markets to equities, all asset classes follow suit to the underlying risk environment. Markets will experience then two main appetites for risk. So first, we have risk on, and second, we have risk off. Let's first look at risk on. Risk on environments are often carried by a combination of expanding corporate earnings, optimistic economic outlook, accommodative central bank policies, and speculation. Yes, fairly straightforward. So when we are in a period of economic growth and relative strength, we can see that the economies are improving. We're likely to take more risk as traders, particularly for risky assets, perhaps like equities or, or risky, uh, risky commodities um, that will be looking to, to obviously deliver more profit, a rate of return, a higher rate of return for that added extra risk that we take as traders. Um, that is the time when we're experiencing these potentially growth, a very strong growth periods. We'll be looking to add risk and speculate as a result. As investors feel the market is being supported by strong, influential fundamentals, they perceive less risk about the market and its outlook and are more willing to take on risk. Absolutely. That is absolutely the case for traders. As perceived risk falls in the market, investors assume a higher risk tolerance. Volume and interest will increase for riskier assets like equities and high bonds. 
and that's absolutely the case. We have a, a large increase in interest for risky assets. Um, very, very risky, potentially very risky equities could be, um, you know, not particularly in the S&P 500, but lower denominations of equity indices where you often see uh, capital flows go in across nations um, in terms of a good, a good trade business between regional nations. Uh, and obviously that, that the aim of those trades are to look for higher rates of return. When we do see, um, I suppose, a risk off approach, which we'll be discussing now, we do see that money retract and actually pull back, contract from, from global investment. Stocks, it's definitely worth noting as a trader, stocks or equity markets are generally seen as riskier assets than bonds. And if we think what a bond structurally is, it's a debt instrument, perhaps we'll take an example of a 10 year dated bond um, for uh, the German Bund, the German government. It's effectively a loan of uh, 100,000 pounds on one year bond that you're giving the German government. And within that 10 year period, they'll be making rate payments that will hopefully come to around two, 3% at nominal levels over the, the duration of the loan or the bond purchase. So it's not a, it's not a fantastic rate of return to 2% over a, such a long period of time, 10 years. What we do look to do is invest in equities. Something like an equity obviously could return. We look at Amazon this year has returned over 50% in 2017. So absolutely fantastic returns are available for those um, very strong yet riskier asset classes. Let's have a look particularly at a risk on example and it really sends us a signal to to what the current appetite or tolerance for risk is in the marketplace at this time. Now I've chosen this market in particular the euro Japanese yen because it has very strong attachments to the risk on risk off approach particularly because um, well this move itself will be described as a euro move as I will as I will discuss through the chart. However, the Japanese yen as a currency itself is known as a safe haven currency. Now, what that means, guys, is that when there is huge uncertainty in the markets, you see capital flight push capital towards and things like gold as a store of wealth and also currency like the Japanese yen. Um, so one example could be when there's a very strong equity uh, sell off and um, capital flow will, will go into Japanese yen just to store that as cash for a while before markets come back to a high level or a tolerant level of risk. So this is the euro against the Japanese yen. So what we're trying to do as currency traders is trade strength for weakness. So it's the perfect example here to show you a European example approach to a, to a risk on trade. Here we have the French election. Now, if we do recall back, we had the far right Marine Le Pen um, against many other competitors. Um, but who won was Emmanuel Macron, who was um, regarded as well a good friend to Europe. He wanted to push on and continue growth in the European Eurozone economies and was hailed as um, a very strong politician in terms of uh, focusing on recovery as opposed to immigration law and other things. So what we see is the French election here, 2017. The market, the euro yen, is just bouncing from lows. Then we see a bit of a shock surprise in the in the French election, the bullish market gap as the market jumps over the weekend. We see the market um, open up many many ticks higher, and um, just on the open uh, on Sunday night there, um, after the the election results from from the weekend in France. Now that's very significant technically, but what we're trying to do here is analyze this fundamentally and make decisions. So what is the story behind this trade? Well. The surprising overwhelming support for Emmanuel Macron led to him taking the Fr French presidency of May 2017. As a politician focused on European growth and diplomacy, his campaign was very different from far-right opposition leader Marine Le Pen. The market sentiment quickly turned to a risk-on environment. <clears throat> so we have a risk-on environment in Euro, in Euro-denominated assets, i.e. the Euro currency, that will lead to Euro price increases. At the same time, we have risk on sentiment pushing back in, filling those greedy investors with risk on sentiment. And, and we see money retract from the Japanese yen itself. So it's a real, a real story of risk on sentiment, changing the market structure um, and changing the actual 
um, currency pair strength versus weakness we see a very strong definitive trend and that's really the start of it in the euro japanese yen <clears throat> let's move on to risk off risk off environments can be caused by widespread corporate earning downgrades contracting or slowing economic data uncertain central bank policy a rush to safe haven investments and many other negative economic data as perceived risk rises investors sacrifice return for safety so risk off is obviously the opposite of the risk on uh, risk tolerance scale we see investors really sacrificing their want for for capital their want for profit for a return to safety they want to store their profits gained throughout the financial trading year in a safe haven currency or commodity some investors harness risk off trading in an effort to meet their investment objectives this particular strategy hinges on the broader sentiment of the global assets market with a belief that the rising or falling confidence of investors can motivate them to favor one asset class over another absolutely and again to reiterate a good example of this is capital flight to safe haven assets can often occur we see the gold market we see the japanese yen market we see bond markets or treasury the treasury markets in the us a lot of capital goes into bond markets during times of uncertainty and it's indicative of current market sentiment i.e tolerance for risk at that time I want to point out this risk off um, example. I don't need to go through it in too too much detail. I know you're really all aware of this. The 2008 financial crisis was considered a risk off year, an entire year whereby investors aimed to reduce risk by selling all speculative or risky investments and move money into non-risk positions. Now, apart from the obvious, why do we think this could happen? Well, obviously we have Lehman Brothers, one of the largest investment banks historically and um, very traditional investment bank on Wall Street actually collapsing something that has really never happened before and sends a, a huge shock down the market in terms of investment and retail banking we then see throughout the year obviously the financial crisis ensuing but as a trader or as a investor or a portfolio manager owning all these asset classes perhaps even in a diversified portfolio we see a real attempt to reduce risk by selling all speculative or risky investments and what we want to do there in this case when we have a risk off approach is move money into non-risk positions or non-risky assets to to keep the money safe to, to look for capital protection not necessarily always looking for um, those profit opportunities when they're just not available to us in the marketplace now it should be said that when we understand the risk off approach in terms of risk tolerance we can then look for those assets perhaps like gold like our treasury bonds to actually look to follow that momentum to the downside or upside in those in those assets themselves let's go through some economic data it's very important that we have a, a real contextual idea of what economic data moves markets throughout the eurozone throughout the world uh, and throughout domestic economies in terms of structuring interest rates and structuring perceived um, ideas of support and, and growth within an economy. In fundamental analysis and decision making, we establish that knowledge is power for the fundamental trader. <clears throat> Your ability to analyze economic data with its fundamental effect on asset prices and in relation to the current market sentiment is paramount to trading success. That's absolutely the case. Now let's discuss many of the economic data variables that are essential to the economy and to us as financial traders. Consumer Price Index, or CPI, it's the change in the price of goods and services purchased by consumers. The CPI accounts for the majority of overall inflation, and inflation is important to currency valuation as rising prices lead central banks to raise interest rates in keeping with their mandate for price stability. Let's not forget that central banks have mandates to keep prices across the domestic economy stable so that there isn't a huge amount of fluctuation and both in the currency and with the level of overall goods within that economy so it's crucial in terms of interest rates and its effects and obviously as a currency trader we need to know and understand consumer price index 
crude oil inventories. Obviously, this figure will be uh, subject to you deciding to trade um, the WTI crude or perhaps Brent crude oil uh, markets. What is it? Well, the crude oil inventories is a change in the number of barrels of crude oil held in inventory by commercial firms during the past week. So it's it's every week this figure is announced, I believe every Wednesday at 3.30 at UK time. It influences the prices of oil and all other petroleum products. It also has a very strong impact on growth as many industries rely on the commodity to produce goods. Employment change. Employment change is it's very simple. It's the change in the number of people employed and is a key indicator to reflect labor market conditions and the overall health of the domestic economy. Particularly, it would be very important in those economies that are perhaps experiencing very disparaging levels of employment. And um, if they're not picking up with the rest of the Eurozone, perhaps at the moment, we look towards those indicators to to show an overall level of growth um, as a Eurozone um, Eurozone block. So that those employment change figures would be significant for many, many other different uh, nations across um, across the globe, really, um, in terms of just looking at one domestic economy. GDP, or otherwise known as gross domestic product, it's the change in total level of output produced by an economy. It is the broadest measure of economic activity and the primary gauge of the economy's health. So that is what we use, and that is the, certainly the figure that we use to describe um, the business cycle, whether we are in a period of um, recession, whether we're in economic boom, or whether we're experiencing a slump. A slump will be obviously negative GDP, where we fall back into recession and continue to to slide. So it's it's the broadest measure of economic activity, and obviously gauges the health of the economy. The German ZU or ZEW, it's a key sentiment indicator based on German institutional investors and analysts. The reason why it is so significant, well, it's the the actual investor and analysts that that have a say, that, that have the input into the indicator itself. It is a leader in, leading indicator in terms of economic health, but those analysts have the know-how, they've been in the market and um, financial markets for a long time and they're regarded as experts within the field, so their sentiment is often seen as an early signal of future economic activity. FOMC, well, the FOMC, it roughly comes around, yeah, it's announced eight times a year. The FOMC usually changes the statement slightly, simply with the wording in the statement at each release, and this is to reflect changes in economic performance and guidance. It is the primary tool the FOMC uh, uses to indicate monetary policy. So for those U.S. traders, and obviously the world looks as the U.S. economy, looks towards the U.S. economy as the biggest and most productive economy in the world um, to to show signs to the rest of us in terms of global economic growth. So very, very significant indeed. Non-farm payrolls, again, a huge economic figure in the United States. It's the change in number of private sector jobs from the previous month in the US economy. And it is, of course, worth noting that that does not count for farming jobs. They're actually not counted within the NFP figure. The NFP figure is considered the most vital data of economic performance in the US and is released after the month ends. And as a result, job creation is of huge importance to the US. We see that figure come out on month end relative to the month just before, and we see how the, the labor market conditions are improving or disproving across the United States. Manufacturing PMA is a survey of purchasing managers in the manufacturing industry. Why would that be important? Well, it does give us a significant insight from corporate, uh, either corporate America or corporate Europe or wherever the purchasing managers index is coming from. As business reacts quickly to market conditions, it's a leading indicator of business performance and has a relevant insight into the company's view of the economy. Perhaps one of the most important, again, official bank interest rates, and this is of keen significance over the next coming two to three years. The interest rate at which central banks lend to all other financial institutions.
And obviously these interest rates trickle through the, the rest of the economy, the whole financial services sector and lead even to formulating your interest rate on your mortgage and your car loan and many of these diversified products that are offered in retail banks. Short-term interest rates are the paramount factor in currency valuation. Traders more often will look to other indicators to predict how these rates will change in the future. And last but not least, we have retail sales. Changing the total value of sales at retail level. It's the primary gauge of consumer spending, which accounts for the majority of overall economic activity. And that is a very important gauge, consumer spending. When we have something like a credit crisis, which we experienced not so long ago there uh, as, a, as a byproduct of the financial crisis, we look towards um, gauging consumer spending to see if growth is starting to spark again and come back into the economy. Let's have a look now at buy the rumor, sell the fact, and how market participants can gear up for these trading opportunities. Buying the rumor or selling the fact is a piece of trading advice developed in early stock market trading. It relates to a situation where the price of a stock would move higher due to traders buying because of rumor they simply heard about possible company acquisitions or higher than expected earnings reports. So there is many, many different examples there that uh, could start the rumor mill where traders would actually decide to trade off these rumors and actually position themselves in the market. With the impression the rumor will eventually come true, actual buy side volume is created. So that's what happens now. It should be worth noting, depending on the rumor, sell side volume can be uh, created as well. It's not always on the buy side. Particularly, it has more of a common approach to buy side volume when we discuss buying the rumor, selling the fact, and equity trading. Inevitably, when the news or economic event occurs and the rumor turns out to be untrue, the sell the fact sentiment takes hold of the market. The company earnings perhaps come out negative, which causes a quick sell side shock to the market in question. So that's a classic example of hearsay where traders uh, interact with the market based on a rumor of, of a possible acquisition or uh, perhaps very good earning reports. When the fallacy turns out to be untrue, then the market, of course, reacts differently. And then the trade is sell the fact. And we have a picture here with our financial traders, particularly, I think, equity traders. And I would like to just read the quote at the bottom, indicative of how market participants can gear themselves and trade off hearsay and rumors. The good news, sir, is that Harris was able to sell off or losing stock. The bad news is that Simpson here bought them from Harris. <laughs> so that is certainly indicative of how market traders can involve themselves willy-nilly trading off rumors and actually looking to profit and speculate from such rumors but then obviously the sell side factor may come in when the story unwinds it should be worth noting in the forex markets buying the rumor selling the fact is interpreted differently mainly because rumors are not as common and the vast number of variables affecting forex markets would make it very difficult for a rumor to cause any real momentum or movement in price now, unless the rumor is an absolutely huge groundbreaking rumor that will totally rearrange the Forex markets, it is very unlikely that it will cause sustained or, or a very large shock to, to price in the Forex markets, given the liquidity and given the, the depth of the Forex markets indeed. The Forex equivalent to buy the rumor sell effect is to trade in anticipation of current news releases. Traders often see news releases as a way of making a lot of money very quickly. Now, it's not always the case, but many traders do take very small positions uh, in preemptive positions before news releases are about to occur. An economic announcement like the, month, uh, the monthly non-farm payrolls figure can cause dramatic changes in asset prices and many traders conduct fundamental analysis and trade in anticipation of speculative prices. By the time the news has been released, many traders have traded based on the forecasted number 
and are now ready to sell the fact. So let's just rewind. Let's just think about this for a moment. We have perhaps a non-farm payrolls. We believe it's going to be very strong given the forecast. And before the figure comes out, we actually make a trade. As a trader, as a fundamental analysis and our decision making, um, we have actually made a preemptive decision to enter the market before the figure. We're, we're not guessing, we're using our fundamental uh, discussion of the, of the markets in question and positioning for the move itself. Now, the figure may come out um, very positive indeed. We're on the right side of the market and that's fantastic. The market trades up and we're in a profitable position. What is our decision now? Well, obviously, if we decided to, many traders could, could have very well made the same speculative position. We could sell or trade for a, a nice profit and then what we could do is actually sell the fact we could look for a pullback in that price, given that many traders may have expected or the market has already pressed in this move to the upside. And we now are looking to sell the fact. And more often than not, we actually do see very strong pullbacks in trades like this. Now, as it is our quest as fundamental analysts and economic decision makers to look for these trading opportunities fundamentally, we must involve trading behavioral finance into our decision making. Now, why is that the case? Well, we just discovered uh, how rumors can affect the market and how selling the fact then can be the reverse side of that trade. On the trading floor, all action is based on news. Therefore, rumors in the financial markets have become almost a daily phenomenon. If we think of rumors as a form of behavior, we know that rumors are one of the oldest mass mediums of communication in the world. And that's most certainly the case. If you ever recall any old wife tale that you've probably heard, um, it's probably from hundreds of years ago. And that's, that's the rumor mill that keeps these stories in motion. That's no different to all these rumors that circulate the financial markets only in much shorter time frames. We include this concept, uh, concept with the probability of making money it is easy to see then why rumors can have a sudden, such a sudden and effective impression on financial markets. And that's certainly the case. Imagine a rumor that can circulate and effectively uh, give people information that they can make money from. Well, that's indicative. That's exactly what happens in the financial markets and why many market participants trade and position themselves prior to the actual news event uh, and actually trading the rumor itself. Let's observe how some markets can actually react to these rumors. Now, I have a few setups here to go through. We have the NASDAQ 100, which is the tech-heavy US equity index. Um, and here we have some very um, inconsistent price action, albeit to the upside, there's a lot of volatility. What is the story behind this rumor? Well, in early December 2017, CNN reported that FBI Director James Comey was going to testify to Congress that President Donald Trump was heavily involved in pre-election diplomacy with Russia that led to election rigging. Now, a very, very serious piece of news um, outlining and implicating Donald Trump in election rigging. If that's the case, I would assume the markets would, would see a really strong sell-off. But again, we're just reacting to a rumor here. Technically, we see some weakness to the downside already. When the news breaks, this is the candle here where we see significant price action and it really tells a story within that trading period. What happens is the price action trades down to new lows, a lot of weakness there, but within the rumor, within the real trading day, we see a full retracement almost to opening levels on the market closing just below those levels. Then we see a very, very bearish candle um, just thereafter with um, some more indecision within um, the two to three day trading period. Very, very technically significant if you actually look at that as technical analysts. But what does it tell us in terms of the rumor mill? What does it tell us in terms of the story behind this? Well, obviously as market participants, how did we trade this? We sell the rumor. When we hear the rumor, that is such a fundamental break um, in terms of scandal, in terms of how we perceive the president of the United States and how that affects equity prices, we see a strong sell-off. But effectively, we're selling the rumor here. It's a CNN report, unconfirmed. Then as the story emerges, at the end of the week, President Trump, it had emerged, had simply pushed him to end the FBI investigation early, but was not implicated in any scandal. And of course, what we see is by the fact with some very strong um, trading to the upside in uh, the 
in the overall trend we see it just retrace i can use my epic pen here just to actually show this by the fact literally from our indecision candle here we see a very strong trend back to the upside as a by the fact sentiment really starts to dominate uh, market interaction there in discussing trading behavioral finance we can look towards a second example another fascinating rumor here we have um t-mobile in the u.s uh, a telecommunications company and some really um unquantifiable news about uh, a possible merger with at&t one of the uh, rivals and another big provider within the telecommunications sector in the united states we have uh, uncovering at&t and t-mobile discussing merger talks in an effort to better compete with competitors what do we see with the price action we see a by the rumor mill starting already we see a albeit from 61 around 61 to 63 dollar jump within a very short period of time what happens and what really unfolds within the story is the rumor turns out to be true but despite the talks both parties both parties very quickly fail to reach an agreement and the merger fails and then the sell the fact trade comes straight into the marketplace and um, as those early just think about what happens there in, in terms of trading those early market speculators buying the rumor albeit proved right the market direction is clearly not with them and they have to get out of those positions that allows them to sell their positions and it allows a lot of new sellers into the market to drive those prices down to new lows there early november 2017. in terms of uh, fundamental analysis and decision making how do we avoid market traps well we have a legendary british american investor and professor here benjamin graham uh, give us some fantastic insight to the market he uh, has a very famous quote observation over many years has taught us that the chief losses to investors come from the purchase of low quality securities at times of favorable business conditions and that is indicative of doing your due diligence as a fundamental analyst and making those well-informed decision-making um, trades particularly when we are in times of very strong economic boom a lot of traders simply believe prices will still go up no matter what the asset they decide to trade or no matter what the equity they decide to trade that is not the case certainly we do our due diligence for each particular fundamental trade in each particular asset or market in question as fundamental analysts it is essential we focus our decision making on all fundamental news affecting the price of the asset we must never rely on any one variable and that's certainly the point we'd like to make there how do we avoid these necessary um are these very common market traps and um, particularly as beginner traders well a few points to look out for avoid trading with the dumb money and this is indicative of actually looking for good trading opportunities as well that we try and trade with the smart money in reverse we do not want to be the last person buying a very very strong move to the upside or the last person selling a very very um, um, weak move to the downside um, so avoid trying to jump in and chase the markets uh, and obviously that leads on to a second point being the dumb money following in being the last um rat to jump ship when the ship is going down is not the wi the wisest trading decision indeed always protect your trade with the stop loss now we will have plenty lessons on risk management capital protection is absolutely key and paramount to your trading success in terms of avoiding those market traps always protect your trade with the stop loss do monitor the markets at all times and a key point here is do not become a victim of overconfident analysis so again relating to the point of the webinar fundamental analysis and decision making well obviously we need to monitor the markets and that is one downside i would certainly say to fundamental an uh, analysis that many traders do a lot of research a lot of due diligence in formulating trading decisions and because they've put a lot of time and research into the market they cannot take a loser when the market proves them wrong so do not become a victim of overconfident analysis and always monitor the markets learn to combine fundamental decision making with technical decision making and that lends itself to always trying to stack the odds in your favor as a fundamental and technical trader to heighten your probability of successful outcome fundamentals and timing absolutely a key a key aspect to financial trading 
uh, given that fundamental analysis aims at having specific expertise in certain markets, this knowledge factor will help the traders to enter the market at a more specific time period. Now, it's a very difficult feat or, or um, challenge that lies ahead, but it is indicative for some markets where your fundamental analysis and your expertise will heighten your probability or heighten your skills in terms of timing and entering the market. Now, that does sound difficult, but let me give you a few examples. Seasonality is a phenomenon that causes crop prices to behave in a relatively predictable manner year in and year out. So if you are a fundamental analyst and you are studying perhaps the, the soft commodities, for example, wheat, sugar, uh, corn, coffee, commodities like these are very, very seasonal and in relation to the weather and nation which where they are grown. So your analysis will take a, a lot of fundamental bearing on the supply and demand functions of those crops and as a result of the seasonality factor um, underlying the, the price of those assets changing year in and year out. And obviously in terms of timing, it will allow you to focus in a more specific time period to actually looking for those trading opportunities. Microeconomic trends indicate consistent growth, consistent economic growth, and so equity investors activate a buy the dip mentality. Again, if we know that we're in a very, very strong macroeconomic trend to the upside, current market conditions are strong, we look for perhaps those market corrections or, or those times when short-term uh, price volatility do send the markets a little lower, and those can provide us with buying opportunities. Fundamental buying opportunities certainly and would be the decision there. Bond yields react to interest rate changes and in theory conform to a yield curve. Now, quite complicated. Generally, bonds have a yield curve, uh, and which simply means that they have different durations to the bond structure. Um, we'll pick a bond, let's say that the German bond has a two year, uh, a five year, a 10 year, and a 30 year um, duration. Altogether, that will create a yield curve reflecting uh, the yield on, on the, the price of the bond and its rate of return on the, the bond itself. Now, in terms of actually trading and looking for timing trades, we know that um, these interest rate changes affect price and affect yield. And when there is a divergence from the yield in one duration or another, it is to converge back into a, a nominal yield curve. Those can, can allow us fundamental trading opportunities should we understand better the expertise in the bond markets indeed. Timing, and this is the main point, timing is always the most difficult and sought after skill for financial traders. And that's absolutely the case. If everyone had perfect timing skills, we will all be making a lot of money in the financial markets. Knowing when exactly to enter the markets before prices move or soon after would deliver the sharpest of trading edges. As we are not able to consistently do this, we must focus our attention to stacking the odds in our favor, both with fundamental knowledge of the markets and how they react to news events and with technical insight into price movement itself. So all combining, we need to have a full combining, fully broad based approach to our fundamental analysis and um, to allow well-informed decision makings. So that's, that's the real point. Um, to actually construct well-deformed decision makings when entering the markets. Now that concludes our study on fundamental analysis and decision making volume two. In this webinar, we looked at fundamental analysis and the risk environment. And obviously that considers and takes a fully broad approach to risk off sentiment and risk on sentiment in the market. We discussed and analyzed economic data and how they affect market prices. We looked at buying the rumor and selling the fact and how they actually both uh, provide very good trading opportunities when we know that our fundamental analysis is not in sync with these opportunities. We looked at behavioral finance in trading and how that can lead to trading opportunities as well and moved on quite nicely there. We looked at avoiding the market traps to, to try and avoid those very, very common pitfalls beginner traders obviously occur when entering the financial markets. And then last but not least, we finish off with fundamental timing. We can agree that uh, timing is the most difficult skill when deciding to trade the financial markets, but with a keen eye to your fundamental uh, analysis approach, 
Um, we look to have well-informed decision-making skills and obviously add some technical analysis in there as well to stack the odds in our favor. Thank you very much for joining us on this installment of Courses On Demand brought to you by Forex.Academy. We do hope to see you very soon. Bye for now.